I used to work at a place that was part of a non-profit organization. One night, the security guard called out sick, and I was the only person available to take his place. The building stayed open until 10 p.m., and by 7 p.m., everyone had already gone home. The building, big and old-fashioned, required me to sit at a desk and watch the cameras until 10 p.m., when our truck driver would come to pick up some artwork. As the clock neared 10 p.m., the old elevator on the fifth floor started to move. It shouldn't have been in use at this hour. I had just seen the last person leave two hours ago on the cameras. Holding my baton, I went upstairs to investigate. As I ascended to the second floor, I heard footsteps behind me, seemingly coming from the lobby. Terrified. I rushed downstairs, wondering if I had forgotten to lock the front door. But it was secure. The elevator door opened, revealing no one inside. Thinking my boss might be playing a prank, I called out his name while climbing the stairs. No one was on the second floor, but I heard the elevator move again. It was on its way back up to the fifth floor. Reaching the third floor, the creepiest thing happened. I heard the elevator stop just above me, accompanied by more footsteps. When I finally got to the fifth floor, no one was there, but I noticed a creepy statue at the end of the hall. Despite my fear, I mustered the courage to go past the fourth floor, descending to the creepy third floor. I nearly jumped out of my skin when I saw something moving in my peripheral vision. Trying to convince myself it was just a roach, I continued. But then, I saw the outline of a skinny person with messy hair running by the president's office door at the end of the hall. Startled, I gathered courage and moved toward the area. The elevator started moving again, and footsteps echoed in the staircase. Panic set in, and I ran into the meeting room hiding near the windows. If I saw someone lurking in the building, I was ready to jump out. The elevator doors opened on my floor, and someone softly called out, Hey, Jess. I yelled for them to leave me alone as the footsteps approached. The door opened, and without looking up, I prepared to swing my baton when I stopped. It was the truck driver. I was so relieved to see him. He got me cleaned up and assisted in closing up the place. Then he gave me a ride home. I have no idea what was going on that night, but seriously, screw that place. I never worked another security shift there at night again. A couple of years ago, I was sailing on a ship that maneuvered offshore, looking after a pipeline about a half mile long. As the ship was unhooking from the pipeline, the line used to hold the ship to the pipe's connection got wrapped around a person's leg. It sucked him through the rails, and he fell about 30 feet into freezing water. The general alarm sounded for a man overboard, waking me up at around five o'clock. Confused, I woke up to find everyone frantically running around on deck. Once I realized this was no drill, I ran to the starboard side. Three life rings were in the water, and one was about three feet away from the man overboard. He couldn't reach it. Having a work vest on that kept him afloat, but hypothermia had already set in. He moved slowly and weakly, called out for help. At this point, it was clear he couldn't grab the life rings. Half the crew and I ran to the rescue boat to unhook it, while the other half tried to get him onto the ship in some other way. It seemed to take forever to get the rescue boat down. The hold down straps were rusted and took a lot of effort to remove. The cover was wrapped around the boat and impossible to get off. The hoist was the slowest of all time, taking what felt like 10 minutes in that crucial moment. I was sure this guy was going to die. Finally in the water, we got two guys in the rescue boat and started toward him. Of course, everything that could go wrong did, and the 
the engine cut out. Luckily, we got it started again. At that point, I ran back to the starboard side. Everyone was yelling and panicking, asking, where is he? Do you see him? One of the mates said someone had lowered down a ladder and he had managed to grab onto it, but his leg was still caught in that line and we couldn't get it free. The line got tugged and he got sucked underneath the ship. Everyone seemed to go silent. I looked down and saw the man's boot floating up toward the surface. A guy walked up to me and said, he's gone. After nerve wracking moments, the crew in the rescue boat continued to search anyway and radioed that they found him further along, bobbing in the water face down, still attached to the hoist line. He was unconscious and not breathing. The rescue crew tried pulling him onto the boat and the swell of the sea impacting his chest made him spit up water. The crew radioed back that miraculously, he had regained consciousness. The line was removed from his leg and he was pulled fully into the boat. The boat headed straight to shore where a beach crew and ambulance were waiting. They got the guy some coats and put them. Became conscious enough to understand what was going on, but he couldn't speak at all. The ambulance rushed him to the ER for extreme hypothermia and near drowning. The guy's vest ended up saving his life in more ways than one. It kept him afloat and visible. I say visible because in those conditions, if he didn't have that vest on, we probably would have never seen him again in that water. Things luckily did not result in his death, but they easily could have due to the temperature of the water equipment failure, and the fast reaction time required. It was the scariest thing that ever happened to me while sailing. The look of terror on the guy's face is still with me to this day. The feeling of being absolutely powerless to help, even though he was mere feet away from us. He spent a few days in the hospital afterward and miraculously suffered no serious injuries if you don't count the near-death experience. On a cross-country road trip with a colleague, we were driving through West Texas on a major highway. In the desolate area, even the major highway was pretty isolated. Truck stops or gas stations were about every 100 miles, solitary with no other buildings in sight, and there weren't really any towns. It was a late night, driving for about four hours. I can usually drive for about eight before getting tired, but my friend could only drive for about four or five hours before she was done. Before it was my turn, we were getting low on gas, about a quarter of a tank left. When you travel the road often, you learn to fill up when you get the chance, as you never know what might happen. She was looking out for a gas station as we drove along, it's really corny, but we were talking about fate, destiny, and some other weird stuff at the time. That sort of conversation gets me keyed up and worried, so I was trying to change the subject. She took an exit while we were talking, and I got out my coffee mug to fill it up during my turn for driving. We pulled up into a typical middle-of-nowhere gas station. Just a simple station with the trailer out back assuming that's where the people who owned the station lived. Another car was parked out front, doors off to one side. We got out, still talking, and walked up to the double doors, each of us grabbing a door handle. However, the door was locked. I turned and looked around to see if there was a sign indicating their return, like back in 20 minutes or something. Several things caught my attention in succession. The coffee maker inside was halfway done brewing a fresh pot. The monitors showing the store were visible from the outside, and there was a splash of bright red on the door in the back of the place, 
Upon closer inspection, I suddenly... The store. Not wanting to entertain any further conversation with the creepy old man. As I wandered away, I could feel his gaze lingering on me, but I tried my best to ignore it. I decided to head to the food section, hoping to lose him in the crowded aisles. However, as I turned into a different aisle, there he was again, still trailing me. My discomfort grew, and I quickened my pace, desperately trying to shake him off. Eventually, I made my way to the checkout area. Thinking that the presence of other people would deter him, I grabbed a few random items and joined the line. To my dismay, he stood behind me, continuing his unwarranted commentary on movies and asking personal questions. As the cashier scanned my items, I mustered the courage to confront him. Look, I'm not interested in talking. Please leave me alone, I said firmly. He seemed taken aback for a moment, but then a creepy grin spread across his face. Just trying to be friendly, sweetheart, he replied. Ignoring his comment, I paid for my items and quickly left the store. I glanced back, and thankfully, he didn't follow me outside. Once I felt a safe distance away, I called my friend to share the bizarre encounter and warn her about the strange man in Tesco. Reflecting on the incident later, I couldn't shake off the feeling of unease. It was a reminder of how unsettling encounters could happen anywhere. Even in familiar places like a local store, I never found out what the old man's intentions were. But I was grateful to have escaped the situation without any further incident. Friend and stayed out a bit later, I didn't mind since it was part of her newfound religious interest. I picked her up as planned everything seemed normal. Wednesday night, she mentioned she wanted to attend both churches. I found it a bit odd, but figured it was her choice. I dropped her off at her friend's house after school, where she'd then go to the evening church service. I passed the time at home, just watching TV and relaxing. Around 9 p.m., I got a call from my sister. She sounded panicked, told me to come pick her up immediately. She said something felt off at the evening church, and she wanted to leave. I rushed to her friend's house and picked her up. On the way back home, she explained what happened. During the service, a man she hadn't seen before approached her. He seemed overly interested in her attendance and asked personal questions. He made her uncomfortable, so she decided to leave early. As she exited the church, she noticed the same man following her. Fearful, she called me, and that's when I picked her up. Concerned for her safety, I decided to accompany her to both churches the next day. When we attended the night service, the man was nowhere to be seen. However, my sister decided she no longer felt comfortable going there, and we reported the incident to the church staff. The following Sunday, we attended her boyfriend's family church together. Everything seemed normal until we noticed the same man from the other church sitting in the back. This time, he approached us directly, acting overly friendly. We immediately left and informed the church staff once again. After this incident, my sister decided to take a break from attending any church. We reported the man to the local authorities, but unfortunately, without concrete evidence, there wasn't much they could do. We never encountered him again, but the experience left us both uneasy about the intentions of some individuals in places we once considered safe. The upcoming retreat. I wasn't interested in any of that. My primary concern was getting my sister home once my sister was out, I immediately scolded her for not responding to my calls and messages, emphasizing how worried I had been. She apologized, explaining that they were in a prayer session and couldn't have their phones on. I thanked the lady for the information, 
but made it clear that my sister had to leave immediately. As we drove home, my frustration and concern lingered. I couldn't understand why they needed to keep her so late, especially considering our parents' instructions. When we got home, I told our parents about the situation, and they were just as puzzled and concerned. We collectively decided that my sister would not be attending the retreat. It was unsettling how the church had kept her without any consideration for our family's arrangements and communication. While my sister was upset about missing the retreat, we prioritized her safety and the need for responsible communication. It was a lesson for both of us about setting clear boundaries and ensuring we stayed connected, especially in situations that could potentially jeopardize our well-being. The incident prompted us to be more cautious about commitments and to prioritize family communication over external influences. I told her that I wanted to go home, feeling uneasy about the man who had been following me. My mom, sensing my urgency, agreed to leave. As we headed towards the exit, I kept glancing back, and to my horror, the man was still there, following us closely. Panic set in as I realized this was more than a mere coincidence. My mom noticed my distress and asked what was wrong. I told her about the man who had been following me, and she immediately took action. Instead of leaving through the main exit, my mom led us to the customer service desk. She explained the situation to the staff, and they called security. The security personnel escorted us safely to our car, ensuring that the man couldn't follow us any longer. In the car, my mom comforted me and assured me that we did the right thing by seeking help. She reported the incident to the store management, providing a description of the man and recounting the unsettling experience. The store took the matter seriously and assured us they would review the security footage. This encounter served as a lesson about the importance of staying vigilant and trusting our instincts. It also highlighted the significance of reporting such incidents to the authorities. My mom's quick and assertive response helped diffuse the situation and kept us safe from potential harm. Reflecting on the incident, I realized the importance of being aware of our surroundings, especially in public places. It's crucial to prioritize personal safety and seek help when needed. This experience stayed with me, shaping my awareness and approach to safety in various situations. Through the tour, I noticed a man who seemed to be following us. At first, I dismissed it as a coincidence, but as we continued, I became increasingly uneasy. He wasn't exactly tailing us closely, but whenever we stopped to admire something or take a picture, he would linger nearby. I decided to test my suspicion by abruptly changing direction a few times. And each time, he adjusted his course to stay in our vicinity. Feeling a sense of deja vu from my Hobby Lobby incident years ago, I discreetly alerted my family about the man. We decided to deviate from the main path and head towards a more crowded area of the palace, hoping to lose him. As we wandered through the crowded sections, I kept an eye on the man, and sure enough, he continued to follow at a distance. It was unsettling, and I felt a mix of frustration and anxiety. My family suggested informing security, but I hesitated, not wanting to cause unnecessary trouble or ruin our vacation. Instead, we decided to take a break at a cafe within the palace grounds. I discreetly observed the man, and to my relief, he seemed to lose interest and eventually disappeared from sight. We stayed at the cafe for a while, just to be sure, before continuing our tour. Throughout the remainder of the day, we remained vigilant, constantly scanning our surroundings. 
Thankfully, we encountered no further issues, and the rest of our time in Seoul was enjoyable. Reflecting on both incidents, I realized the importance of trusting my instincts and not hesitating to seek help or involve authorities if needed. It's crucial to prioritize personal safety, especially in unfamiliar environments or situations that feel uncomfortable. Though unsettling, these experiences have shaped my awareness and taught me to be proactive in ensuring the safety of myself and those around me. Supervisor came out. The rest of my family had arrived, and we pointed out the guy who was still lingering nearby. The supervisor approached the man and spoke to him in Korean. We couldn't understand the conversation, but it was clear that she was addressing the situation. After a brief exchange, the supervisor came back to us and apologized for the inconvenience. She assured us that they would handle the matter and thanked us for bringing it to their attention. We decided to stay in the cafe for a while to ensure the man didn't follow us further. As we watched from the cafe, the supervisor continued talking to the man, and eventually he walked away in a different direction. It was a relief to see him leave, and we finally felt at ease to resume our visit to the palace. The incident reminded us of the importance of staying vigilant and taking action when necessary. Even in a foreign country, we were grateful for the quick and professional response from the staff at the palace, which helped diffuse the situation and allowed us to enjoy the rest of our trip without further concerns. Both encounters reinforced the significance of trusting instincts, staying aware of surroundings, and seeking assistance when faced with suspicious or uncomfortable situations. These experiences have made me more mindful of personal safety, whether in familiar or unfamiliar environments, terrified. But I did give an accurate description of his clothes, which didn't make him too hard to spot if you knew what you were looking for later that night. I was asleep at my mom's apartment, and I woke up to my uncle standing over my bed. He looked frazzled and asked me if I was okay. I nodded, but asked why he was there. He didn't answer and just walked out of the room. I heard a lot of hushed voices, and then my uncle's bedroom door slammed shut. My cousins continued to stay with us for the next week until the boy was caught. The boy had been in and out of juvie, so my family took extra precautions as the police dealt with the situation. The next morning, I found out the rest of the story. My cousins had gone out to find the boy the night he'd scared me. They found him a couple blocks away and beat the absolute shit out of him. The police showed up before they could do any serious damage the message was clear. They left him in a bloody mess and made sure he knew exactly who had sent them. After that, he never came near me again. The incident stuck with me for a long time, and my cousins always treated me like a little sister. From that point, on the idea of someone so much older being so aggressive and volatile, terrified me for years after that. I've come to understand that the boy was likely dealing with his own demons, but the trauma of that night stayed with me for a long time, and it took a while for me to feel safe playing outside again, especially without my cousins around over the yaw. Years I've learned to be cautious, but not afraid, and to always speak up if something doesn't feel right. It's a lesson that has stuck with me and shaped my approach to personal safety to this day. Terrified, my mom even took me partway up the alley where we suspected he came from, but he was either hiding or had left already. They were unable to identify him. Leia ended up spending the night at our house, 
cut to bedtime. We were in the bathroom brushing our teeth and goofing off. We had a tiny bathroom, so the toilet, sink, and window were pretty much crammed into one corner. Suddenly, there was someone screaming in my backyard. Because of the town and area I grew up in, we assumed it was a fight between my neighbors and my cousins or something. Or maybe just between my cousins themselves. Both happen pretty frequently. Being the little gossips we were, we turned straight to the window and settled ourselves in to look. Only, it wasn't any of them. It was the drunk teenager from earlier. He was waving something in his hand, still screaming about the non-existent borrowed money. When light finally hit the object he had been brandishing, Leia screamed. He had a gun. Immediately, we dropped to the ground, screaming and crying, unable to form coherent sentences. My mom swooped in and shut the blinds, ushering us down to my grandma's, where everybody erupted into chaos. The whole night was spent giving statements to the police, calling uncles, and generally trying to calm Leia and me down. The guy was never found, and life was fairly normal after. My teachers and principal were informed of the situation when school started beforehand. But nothing prepared me for the day mid-fourth grade year when I walked out of elementary school to find this boy and his friends sitting across the street. They weren't technically on school grounds. I tried to justify it. Maybe he had little siblings, or maybe he was just hanging out, but I knew in my heart he was waiting for me. I tried to walk home, but as soon as I would walk in one direction, he and the group of teenagers would match it from across the street. Till I shifted directions again, they would follow suit. Not even a block from school, I made the executive decision to bolt back the way I came and tell a teacher. All hell broke loose again. More police came. The kid was smart, though. When I ran, he had taken off as well, and he was again not found. My mom started picking me up and dropping me off to school after that, so things quieted down a bit. There were still times, though, when I'd be looking out a window alone, and I would see him standing across the street, just watching me. The last incident I never even connected to this situation until years later. He had stopped showing up at my school almost as abruptly as he'd started. I eventually begged, pleaded, argued, and cried enough for my mom to start letting me walk home with Leia again. In hindsight, that was a terrible idea, but I was a really spoiled kid. One afternoon, I split off from the group of kids that Leia and I had been walking with and headed towards the apartment. Because it was an apartment building, the entrance was set up kind of odd. The first door you entered basically just led to a second door, which then took you to a hallway where directly to the right was my grandma's apartment door, and straight ahead was my mom's. When I approached the entrance, I noticed the first door was already open. Okay, whatever. It's not that unusual for my cousins to have left it open. I stepped in, took two steps forward, and went to open the second door. This door was open as well. Now that was weird. I didn't know why at the time, but my grandmother used to be adamant about shutting that door because my older cousin smoked weed, and she didn't want the neighbors to smell it call the cops. On them, I ignored it and continued walking down the hallway. I reached my apartment door to find it standing wide open. My instincts finally kicked in and I bolted. Nobody was at my grandmother's house at the time, so I never got to go up and check the apartment. No signs of forced entry. Nothing being stolen. Nothing even rummaged through. I can't prove it was him hell. We didn't even think it was an option back then. 
because he'd finally left me alone. Only my mother and myself had the keys though. And if it had been my cousins breaking in, they would have stolen something, anything of value to feed their addictions. The door had been closed and locked up to the point of my grandmother leaving earlier. So it was not an accident and it was not a forgot to lock the door scenario. That incident left me with an unsettling feeling, a constant awareness of the shadows around me. As the years passed, the fear gradually faded and life continued without his ominous presence. Yet the memories lingered, an indelible mark on my sense of security. The stranger with his disturbing episodes became a haunting figure in the recesses of my past. To this day, I wonder about his intentions and why he targeted me. The unanswered questions linger in the air, a chilling reminder that sometimes the horrors we face aren't confined to the realms of fiction. As I reflect on those unsettling events, I can't help but shudder, grateful that the darkness he brought into my life eventually dissipated. The scars remain, but so does the strength forged through those eerie encounters. And so the tale concludes, leaving an open door to the unknown. The enigmatic figure may have vanished, but the echoes of his presence reverberate through the corridors of memory, a testament to the inexplicable terrors that can intrude on our lives, terrified. But I did give an accurate description of his clothes, which didn't make him too hard to spot. If you knew what you were looking for later that night, I was asleep at my mom's apartment and I woke up to my uncle standing over my bed. He looked frazzled and asked me if I was okay. I nodded, but asked why he was there. He didn't answer just walked out of the room. I heard a lot of hushed voices, and then my uncle's bedroom door slammed shut. My cousins continued to stay with us for the next week until the boy was caught. The boy had been in and out of juvie, so my family took extra precautions as the police dealt with the situation. The next morning, I found out the rest of the story. My cousins had gone out to find the boy the night he'd scared me. They found him a couple blocks away and beat the absolute shit out of him. The police showed up before they could do any serious damage, but the message was clear. They left him in a bloody mess and made sure he knew exactly who had sent them. After that, he never came near me again. The incident stuck with me for a long time and my cousins always treated me like a little sister. From that point, on the idea of someone so much older being so aggressive and volatile, terrified me for years after that. I've come to understand that the boy was likely dealing with his own demons, but the trauma of that night stayed with me for a long time, and it took a while for me to feel safe playing outside again especially without my cousins around over the yell. Years I've learned to be cautious, but not afraid, and to always speak up. If something doesn't feel right, it's a lesson that has stuck with me and shaped my approach to personal safety to this day. Terrified, my mom even took me partway up the alley where we suspected he came from, but he was either hiding or had left already. They were unable to identify him. Leia ended up spending the night at our house. Cut to bedtime. We were in the bathroom brushing our teeth and goofing off. We had a tiny bathroom, so the toilet, sink, and window were pretty much crammed into one corner. Suddenly, there was someone screaming in my backyard. Because of the town and area I grew up in, we assumed it was a fight between my neighbors and my cousins or something, or maybe just between my cousins themselves. Both happen pretty frequently. 
Being the little gossips we were, we turned straight to the window and settled ourselves in to look. Only, it wasn't any of them. It was the drunk teenager from earlier. He was waving something in his hand, still screaming about the non-existent borrowed money. When light finally hit the object he had been brandishing, Leia screamed. He had a gun. Immediately, we dropped to the ground, screaming and crying, unable to form coherent sentences. My mom swooped in and shut the blinds, ushering us down to my grandma's, where everybody erupted into chaos. The whole night was spent giving statements to the police, calling uncles, and generally trying to calm Leia and me down. The guy was never found and life was fairly normal after. My teachers and principal were informed of the situation when school started beforehand. But nothing prepared me for the day mid fourth grade year when I walked out of elementary school to find this boy and his friends sitting across the street. They weren't technically on school grounds. I tried to justify it. Maybe he had little siblings or maybe he was just hanging out, but I knew in my heart he was waiting for me. I tried to walk home, but as soon as I would walk in one direction, he and the group of teenagers would match it from across the street. Till I shifted directions again, they would follow suit. Not even a block from school, I made the executive decision to bolt back the way I came and tell a teacher. All hell broke loose again. More police came. The kid was smart though. When I ran, he had taken off as well, and he was again not found. My mom started picking me up and dropping me off to school after that, so things quieted down a bit. There were still times though, when I'd be looking out a window alone, and I would see him standing across the street, just watching me. The last incident, I never even connected to this situation until years later. He had stopped showing up at my school almost as abruptly as he'd started. I eventually begged, pleaded, argued, and cried enough for my mom to start letting me walk home with Leia again. In hindsight, that was a terrible idea, but I was a really spoiled kid. One afternoon, I split off from the group of kids that Leia and I had been walking with and headed towards the apartment. Because it was an apartment building, the entrance was set up kind of odd. The first door you entered basically just led to a second door, which then took you to a hallway where directly to the right was my grandma's apartment door and straight ahead was my mom's. When I approached the entrance, I noticed the first door was already open. Okay, whatever. It's not that unusual for my cousins to have left it open. I stepped in, took two steps forward, and went to open the second door. This door was open as well. Now that was weird. I didn't know why at the time, but my grandmother used to be adamant about shutting that door because my older cousin smoked weed and she didn't want the neighbors to smell it call the cops. On them, I ignored it and continued walking down the hallway. I reached my apartment door to find it standing wide open. My instincts finally kicked in and I bolted. Nobody was at my grandmother's house at the time, so I never got to go up and check the apartment. No signs of forced entry, nothing being stolen, nothing even rummaged through. I can't prove it was him hell. We didn't even think it was an option back then because he'd finally left me alone. Only my mother and myself had the keys though. And if it had been my cousins breaking in, they would have stolen something, anything of value to feed their addictions. The door had been closed and locked up to the point of my grandmother leaving earlier so it was not an accident, and it was not a forgot to lock the door scenario. 
That incident left me with an unsettling feeling, a constant awareness of the shadows around me. As the years passed, the fear gradually faded, and life continued without his ominous presence. Yet the memories lingered, an indelible mark on my sense of security. The stranger, with his disturbing episodes, became a haunting figure in the recesses of my past. To this day, I wonder about his intentions and why he targeted me. The unanswered questions linger in the air, a chilling reminder that sometimes the horrors we face aren't confined to the realms of fiction. As I reflect on those unsettling events, I can't help but shudder, grateful that the darkness he brought into my life eventually dissipated. The scars remain, but so does the strength forged through those eerie encounters. And so the tale concludes, leaving an open door to the unknown. The enigmatic figure may have vanished, but the echoes of his presence reverberate through the corridors of memory, a testament to the inexplicable terrors that can intrude upon our lives.